Waiting for YouTube. Oh, I got to hit the upload button. Or is it download? This would be up. Ah, yeah, this would be upload. Uploading? It's uploading. There uplifting. we go. It is uplifting. <sighs> it oh. has. So we're on on. I believe it has been uplifted. Yes, we are now on. We're on what? Test? <laughs> you. Deca. And same as my coach, so. Stop saying that because people are really going to be like, they're going to start Seema's giving know, you huh? drugs. All right, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not only that, but they're going to probably start DMing you like, hey, dude, like I saw Andrew's photo shoot and he did pretty good. Can you tell me what cycle you put him on? <laughs> oh, the internet there, never fails. Hey, for this, uh, oh, go ahead. Dude, um, your, you know the, the thumbnail for the The picture? internet is that so upsetting. You know, yeah, they literally thought like, oh, Mark's looking really old. Like, I, I saw those comments. Do you see that? They thought that was real. <laughs> even, even on Instagram when I'm like, hey, I don't know what's going on with the YouTube community, but like they can't understand the, uh, the irony between saying what, what are the long-term effects of the carnivore diet and this picture of an aged Mark Bell. <laughs> and then in those comments, people are like, dude, you look old, bro. It's like, oh. <sighs> I don't know. I, the, the internet is undefeated. Yeah. Somebody, however, sometimes some people slip through. Mm -hmm. Somebody said the other day, like on my YouTube, and they're like, they're "Like you look like shit, man. You shouldn't be promoting that diet." And I, I just wrote back, and I was like, "Well, I don't know what you're seeing, but you know, I, I'm not like if you're pointing to the fact that I don't look young, I'm, I'm not young. You know, like it's, I don't know. People like they, they think they're gonna like hurt your feelings by saying certain things. I'm just yeah. like. Uh, you know, it just is what it is. Like, I might have some wrinkles and stuff. I'm 43. I think it's pretty normal. Have a little salt and pepper in your beard. I think it's fairly normal. You know, I, I don't have uh, I don't have the genetics of the rock, and I can mm -hmm. admit that, and that's okay. But uh, it's not a big deal. Uh, so your brother and so Chris Bell and um, Michael Hearn posted a picture this morning, and it's just they're, they're just that golds. But mm -hmm. thinking about that, and then I don't know if you guys watched the uh, the halftime show of the uh, Super Saw Bowl. Some of it, yeah. Okay, so Shakira, oh, J -Lo. Okay. Shakira's forty three, J Lo's fifty, and they look, they're they're it, I mean speechless, right? Mm -hmm. And then fast you know, move over to Chris and Mike, you know, and and you too, Mark. Like you guys are aging the wrong way. Like oh, yeah, you on. guys are going backwards. Going every, against the grain. Yeah, every time you guys post a new picture, it's like, shit, man, like, you guys are looking younger, you know, like, so that... I feel like that. I definitely feel like yeah, that. Yeah, and so, like, that that motivates the hell out of me, and I was telling um, my fiance Stephanie, I'm like, dude, we're, like, you know, over 10 years away from being 50-year-olds, you know, like, we got hell of time to train and eat right, like, yeah. I can't wait to see what we do, you know, with more, like, knowledge, education, and training, you know, like, it's it's exciting. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, yeah, that was funny, dude. I couldn't believe how many people were like, "Wow, like Mark, you look terrible in this picture." I was like, you, photo you photoshopped me. Well, it was, and that's the other thing. Like, this is how fast like social media moves. Okay, I think this was last year when the Russians were collecting data from everybody with that this app. with this Face app. Yeah, everybody was using this Face app mm -hmm. and posting pictures. Right. Fast forward a couple months later, and everyone I forgot about it. Totally now. forgot about it, and all I did was take a screenshot from Mark's Instagram and use that as a thumbnail, and people were still just like, "I'm not sure. Like, I'm being serious. Is that is that photoshopped or?" And then one guy was nice. He was like, "Dude, that just goes to show how good your Photoshop skills are." And I'm like, "I can't take credit for it because I didn't even do that." Yeah, the face app. Man. I just stole the picture. <laughs> oh, that app does a great job, but yeah, it's um. That that I just can't believe people really thought that was real. Like, oh, the carnivore diet that makes you old. <laughs> I guess you'd call this like our current events uh, episode because we're going to go over a couple things. But did you see that uh, kid Jamal pull that nine seventy one? Yes, I did, oh, and it man. was fast. What I don't understand. I mean, he's been he's been a very good lifter for a while. I've seen I've been paying attention to him, but um, I know he's had little issues with his grip, um, mm -hmm. which is understandable when you're lifting nearly a thousand pounds. He didn't have any trouble holding on to that one. No, no. And the, the crazy thing again, man, it didn't slow down from start to lockout. I don't know if we're going to show it here. It but went you faster know, like midway through. Yeah. Oh, you know he could have done more. My bad. That's okay. I forgot I had the volume up. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's. It, I guess, you know, when you're rolling the dice on these big weights like this, I, I would imagine he didn't do this in training. He probably, you know, maybe hit a 950 maybe a few months ago. And so he doesn't really know 
where he's at. That's kind of the mystery of powerlifting sometimes. Mm -hmm. You go out on the platform and hopefully you perform like five or sometimes 10% better than you did in training. Oh, grip. 971. Pop. <laughs> right there. Great lockout, everything, man. That was just, you know, he could have gotten like 12 more pounds mm. if you pushed it. You know yeah. what? No one's done a thousand pound sumo deadlift in a competition yet. That's why. You know, so that could be. He definitely in the running for the first uh, thousand pound pull, and then also uh, no one's deadlifted a thousand in a contest that hasn't weighed you know above three hundred pounds. And I think this guy's like two fifty or two forty, right? Yeah, Jamal's around two forty something. I think. Um, do you know what the? Because I think Kaler held the record before this, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know what his weight was or no? Uh, I think Yuri Belkin had it because this oh, is a Yuri. Two, I think this is a two forty two weight class, and, okay. and uh, you're right though. I think Kaler did have it. And I think Yuri beat it, beat mm -hmm. it, and then you know they go back and forth. But then uh, Doctor Deadlift still has that two twenty record. I think in about a year and a half, we'll be wondering who's going to be the first to get like ten twenty something or ten mm -hmm. thirty something. It's just depending on which one of these three gets the thousand first. Somebody might deadlift eleven hundred pounds in a powerlifting meet. You know, like Eddie Hall did it. You know, and he and, and there hasn't been anybody really remotely close to him yet. Mm -hmm. as world records go um you know uh eddie hall by the way uh he started a youtube channel and i don't think he started it too long ago maybe five or six months ago and he has a an amazing interview anyone that's interested in strength anyone that finds it fascinating um to see someone like break a world record or do something that no one's ever done before <clears throat> you got to check out his youtube channel because he has a really good in-depth explanation of like how that day went and how everything went leading up to it the previous record how he beat it his health afterwards like he was he was concussed he was like bleeding out of his eyes he couldn't see uh he he goes through this whole thing and tells you like he's like i couldn't it's like i couldn't i was blind for a little while and he didn't know if he's gonna get like his sight back and i mean it was just some wild, wow. wild stuff happened. Yeah. And he was like, you know what? I was willing to go there. I was willing to push to that point. But then when I got to that point, I was like, you know, whoa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like maybe that wasn't, you know, what I, you know, what I wanted to do. But he also mentioned like, <clears throat> he doesn't think the record's going to be broken anytime soon um, just because of like where he had to go to. It's like, I don't know if anybody else is willing to do that. And yeah. He talks about, um, you know, you guys have heard of this before, like your adrenaline. You know, your adrenaline kicks in, your kid gets trapped underneath something. And you hear this all the time about moms, you know, saving their kid and stuff. Um, but how does their average person or not even average person in this case, how does Eddie Hall, how does he tap into that? They actually say that, like, um, I think untrained people can maybe tap into like 40 or 50 percent of their muscle. Um, I don't know how they get this data, and I don't even know if I have it correct, but this is kind of some stuff that Eddie Hall said during his interview. And then I think in a trained person, it's not that much more. Mm -hmm. It's like 60, 70%. And you may have heard some of the same things about the brain where they think you only have access to like 30% of it. But then there's like gold medalists and there's geniuses and stuff, and they have much more access than your average person. But when it comes to somebody who gets that adrenaline rush, you know, they're they're exponentially going up into that. 90% range, maybe 100% range, and they have access to everything. Yeah. And so he said for himself, he had to get to that point before he lifted. Like yeah. He had to get himself that emotionally, like, you know, wired and stuff. And he thinks that that's why, because he didn't, he didn't think he was going to be able to do it. He legitimately, like, he lifted a few weeks earlier, and he pulled a weight that was kind of close to it, but it wasn't even the 1,100 pounds, and he got it to, like, mid-shin. Yeah. And then he was like, oh, man, I really screwed up because I told everybody I'm going to do this. Am I getting it wrong? I think I heard from Jessica that he worked with somebody. That, you mentioned. Yeah, that's 100% right, yeah. To like, yeah, mm -hmm. to get him, like, to imagine his children were, like, in danger or something, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then that's that's what he, like, I guess, brought up in himself every time he would go for a pull like that. So he knew what it was like so that when he did that 1100, mm -hmm. that's what kind of triggered for him. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's yeah, funny. and he said it was yeah. tricky to like try to get that emotion out and to try to you know do it on that one specific day and and it's not something you can really like train. You can't mm -hmm. really. I mean, you can talk to somebody about it about what you're gonna do, but you can't really put it into practice because it's like it's too over the top. 
Yeah. You know, if you did it in jujitsu, ju- you would like break someone's arm. You'd oh like, no! Ooh, you'd be yeah. like, you'd be like, oh, dude, sorry. Thought somebody was trying to attack my family. You'd snap some. No, you definitely snap somebody up. And it, it takes energy to do that. After doing something like that, you feel so fatigued. Just like it's I'm not like I'm saying I did this at all close to Eddie Hall, but earlier in the, my lifting days, I guess I would try to get myself angry mm. uh, or really just like hyped up and that would make me so tired mm. afterwards so i can't imagine like you even mentioned his eyes were bleeding he was just probably so mentally taxed for weeks do you know if he did anything um anything notable in terms of strongman after that 1100 pool or was that like the last big thing he did he won the world's strongest man well yeah oh yeah. that was after that competition yeah, yeah. oh okay <laughs> yeah well damn okay yeah yeah, yeah I, I it may have you know what I think that's accurate. I think he did. It. I, yeah, I think he did it afterwards. Okay, can't remember the sequencing, but he does talk about it in, in the interview. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but just you know, I think so. He still kind of competes. He'll still do stuff, but he mm-hmm. just doesn't compete on that same level. Yeah, so he doesn't have to like you know put himself through all that shit. But anyway, Eddie Hall is awesome, and if you guys aren't following him, please go over to his YouTube channel and check it out. Um, he, an amazing personality on top of everything else. Um, what about Steffi Cohen? Oh, what is going on with her? What well, it was close to four times body weight. Yeah, That's so insane. she did a squat with four uh, four forty two. Yeah, four hundred forty four hundred forty six pounds. Six weighing a buck fourteen. Why would somebody only weigh one hundred fourteen pounds? By the way, that's mm-hmm. weird. <sighs> Jeez, man. That's she's gonna have a four times body weight squat. Yeah, in, that's in, a nice no looking time. squat. Yeah, I, I I didn't see any of the comments. I wonder how many people are. Like, eh, it's not low enough or something. But she looks she, great too, you know. She yeah. she's she's jacked. Um, but like to me, I, I don't like you know, we we're around some other females that are jacked sometimes. We like having Colleen here and mm-hmm. uh, Brooke Entz and you know, some of these uh people like that. And Steffi, you know, is right is right there with them, but like oh, that's a fucking awesome spot. Yeah. She crushed it. It was actually <laughs> looked pretty easy. Yeah. Um I, I mean, I, I don't think she looks like freaky. I think she looks great. I think she looks pretty freaky. Like, not for, when I yeah, say yeah. freaky, I don't mean like freaky in a bad way, but she is a ball of muscle. Oh, man. no. She, yeah, she's all, <laughs> she's all muscle, but she's like all muscle. You know, she doesn't really, I guess she could compete in some like bodybuilding, but she doesn't look like a bodybuilder to me. She doesn't have so much, uh, uh, you know, such an overgrowth of like muscle mass, you know, mm-hmm. um, especially like through the arms and shoulders, but she is jacked. Yeah. But maybe that's why the uh, her bench isn't you know on par with her squat and her deadlift. Mm-hmm. I wonder how like if she because uh, obviously she cuts for this, but I wonder if she's um, careful about how much muscle she does gain. Mm-hmm. Just because like I feel like she could gain more muscle if she really wanted oh, to, yeah. but maybe like that maybe it'd be more difficult to try and maintain that one fourteen weigh in if she tried to do that. But it's just crazy because like she's breaking her own ret- records one after the other after the other. No one is no one is tailing her, man. You know, I think we, I wasn't, did we, we didn't do an interview with hers or I don't know if we did, but I remember like asking one of our guests who did, who's doing something like that. I don't know if, um, how they feel having no one chasing mm-hmm. them, how like they have to motivate oh, themselves yeah, yeah. to do it. It wasn't Steffi, but she's in the yeah, same boat. Some other people like that. Yeah. yeah. Where you're like, yeah, just why, why do you still even care? You're killing everybody. Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. that's, that's crazy. So I went down to this uh, CrossFit shindig down in Santa Cruz. I got to go to CrossFit HQ. That was really cool. Got to go to Greg Glassman's house. That was really cool. And uh, just food everywhere. It was great. And By it was the way, Greg healthy. Glassman, is he the CEO? He's the CEO, creator of, uh, everyone just calls him coach. Got and it. everyone just calls him coach within the CrossFit community. That The story goes, and you can kind of look this up online and get something a lot more accurate, but the story I heard was there was a guy and the Santa Cruz area, I think that's where he was living at the time, um, training people and making people throw up. And somebody like yourself would go, it's already in really good shape, and you'd come to me and be like, dude, like you got to train with this guy. Like this workout, these workouts are freaky, man. I can't even hang. Mm-hmm. And then someone stupid like myself would be like, yeah, bro, let's go. <laughs> and then I would throw up, and then I would tell somebody else. But that's, <laughs> that's where the CrossFit like puking clown comes from. I don't know if you've ever seen the clown that's like throwing up. It's like a cross, famous CrossFit like image. I haven't. And uh, when I first saw CrossFit, when yeah. I first like kind of, um, I guess, was introduced to it, I was seeing workouts online where people were throwing up. And I was like, 
this is fucking, I was like, I, you know, I was a trainer at the time. I knew everything. Right. So I was like, I can make people throw up. I mean, like, it's fucking easy. You know, all we got to do is like some high rep squats, you know? Oh, wow. Yeah. There's the old puking clown. <laughs> okay. And then there were some like, uh, police officers and other people that wanted to, uh, mil former military, they would hear about it and they'd be like, come on. How bad, seriously, how bad could the training be? Mm -hmm. They'd go and train with them. They'd throw up. You know, they were just getting crushed. And Greg Glassman, um, it, it, Greg Glass Glassman is a pioneer. You know, people can say uh, whatever they want about him. Um, I, I don't know. I don't have any negative experiences with him, so I'm not sure where uh, some of the negativity comes from. I do, I do get the negativity that's around CrossFit, just I've heard it for so long. Oh, that sport hurts everybody, and... It's the same with bodybuilding. It's the same with powerlifting. If you're at a local gym and someone throws your barbell across the gym because they were effing deadlifted on that platform yeah. and they're a powerlifter, that might have been your experience with a powerlifter. You know, um, mm -hmm. if you're at a commercial gym and somebody's doing toes to bar and muscle ups on your the rack that you were trying to set up for some squats, you're going to be pissed at a CrossFitter. You know. Um, and the same thing can happen with, uh, you know, bad interactions with bodybuilders thinking that, you know, they're posing in the mirror and you're like, what is this? This is so stupid. These guys are so narcissistic and you kind of need a little bit of that in bodybuilding, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, you kind of get the point is like, we just, uh, place judgment sometimes on things that we don't know much about, but Greg Glassman and Cro the CrossFit movement, I think is one of the biggest movements to ever happen in fitness. I don't really recall anything, you know, in my time uh being identical or being similar uh the only thing i can there's a couple of things that come to mind like joe weeder you know and and what joe weeder did for bodybuilding oh yeah and the combination of joe weeder and arnold together um that kind of fits in there but to have everyone everyone doing the same thing with a branded like name to it that's really different and that's i know weeder and arnold had an impact on people doing like the weeder principles and Arnold's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding and some of those things, but um, that was also a really long time ago. Nothing like that's happened since. Uh, mm -hmm. Bill Phillips did some cool stuff, but Bill Phillips' stuff was more about like supplements and and body transformations, which no one ever did at the time. So he's a pioneer as well. Yeah. But the CrossFit movement's crazy. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions. There's probably millions of CrossFitters. That's there's like a hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand, and not the same anymore, but at the height of it, it was a contest that had 200,000 people in it. The, mm -hmm. the, the online, uh, the, the, when they would release the, uh, the workouts weekly, uh, the CrossFit Open, what other contest has 200,000 people in it? Like, I'm, I'm not aware of anything else that does anything similar. Like, the only thing that came to my mind whenever I thought about that was, uh, like, American Idol. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't I don't know of any other contest that's that crazy like that. Maybe people can think of some things, but certainly not in the fitness community. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Like the fact that Andrew can like test test his times against uh, somebody in Russia, you know, it, or somebody the same age and all that stuff is really really revolutionary and really cool. And Greg Glassman, the reason why CrossFit became so popular is he had a website, you know, in like 2000 or 2002, mm -hmm. kind of the infancy of the internet. And he stayed consistent with it, and he's done it ever since, and that's why CrossFit blew up so crazy. Yeah. So what is it that you did over there? I just went down there for, it was like a seminar, and I didn't really realize that, it, I understood that they were going to show Game Changers, but I didn't really realize that the whole thing was going to be geared towards rebuttals, uh, <laughs> showing the opposite of Game Changers. And they yeah. said the next time they do a, a workshop like that, they might have people that are for it, because mm -hmm. this was all people that were pretty much uh, against it or... Not even so much against it, but they were, um, they were explaining how data was being held back in certain areas, and they would say, "Hey, look, you know, they they did explain this, but they conveniently left this out, you know." And that's what each person kind of shared. And uh, Georgia Ede was there, uh, who we've right. had on the podcast before, cool. um, and there's a lot of great speakers. Gary Tobbs was there. He's uh, wrote a book called "The Case Against Sugar." I just person after person getting up there talking about. Um, it wasn't so much against veganism. It was more about the inaccuracy of the film, mm -hmm. you know, and I would love to see someone do the same thing. You know, when my brother and I finally come out with this carnivore diet, we'll get it straightened out, straightened out sooner or later. I know he's talking to Netflix tomorrow, so wish him luck. Um, 
but I hope someone does the same thing, you know, because that's what we should be. We should be asking questions and we should be asking good questions. And we should say, how do you know that? You yeah. know, where, where's this information in, in a, in a, in a kind, in a kind way, there's really no reason to like fight about it. How do you know that vegetables do that? How do you know that meat is causing a problem? Mm -hmm. You know, those, those are, those are great questions and people should be concerned about their health. Exactly. And I think it's first off, uh, it'll be awesome when they do have some individuals that are, I guess, for a vegan diet there. But I mean, even I see this throughout like the jujitsu community um, and a lot of lifters, you know, people are trying to do this like a, a vegan diet because of the game changers. I mean, who wouldn't want to do a diet that could help them increase their performance? And when you watch that movie and you see that guy do battle ropes for what, 60 minutes or something <laughs> after going on a vegan diet, even though like, again, it's just the very inaccurate thing that happened there you're going to want to do it, you know? So it's great that they're showing this to the athletes and I guess giving them the knowledge that they need to understand. If you do a vegan diet, these are ways that you can actually do it so you're, you're not messing yourself up. Diet stuff is just so broad too. Yeah. Because Andrew could come in here and he could say, you know what, man, I feel great. But feel great in comparison to what? You know, and when I say it too, like what am I, what am I comparing it to? Yeah. Mm. Maybe my diet previously really sucked or maybe... Uh, maybe there's a combination of things going on. Maybe I'm having, maybe I'm being smarter with my exercise because I've been ex, because I've now been exercising for so long. Now I'm starting to get a better hang of it. You know, mm -hmm. maybe my sleep is better. Maybe my, uh, maybe because you know, for me personally, maybe because I have done certain things from a business perspective, I have less stress or something. You know, like I don't have to worry about bills as much. You know, maybe, maybe there's things like that going on that I'm not even. I just, I'm not even like making anybody aware of it or not sharing that part because I'm not identifying that as the change, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying it's the meat, man. Like, trust me, this is what, it, this yeah. is what's going on. It's making me awesome. I'm telling you. Yeah. And then to just to even like simplify and put it in, in another way is like your shirt to me looks gray, but to Encima, it looks blue. It See? doesn't really look great to him though. No, right? but I'm just saying like, what if, right? Like, so when Mark eats a steak, he feels phenomenal. When I eat a steak, I'm like, oh, my stomach's cramped. Like, whatever it is, you know? Like, mm -hmm. so exactly in comparison to what? Like, yeah. So that is, it's crazy. Like, the, the variables there are, like, through the, the roof. Color comparison is actually great because, like, I don't see colors that great. Like, I could see most stuff. Mm -hmm. But every once in a while, I have to, like, put something next to something. Yep. To, like, literally compare it. I'm like, is that blue or is that more black? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I have to do that at Lulu all the time whenever, <laughs> I, whenever, I, whenever I see stuff there because they have like these heather grays and blues yep. and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, am I like going blind or am I colorblind? I'm like, what's the, you know, but I'll put them next to each other and yeah. it, it gives you, uh, yeah, so comparing it makes a big difference. You yeah. know, as athletes, we're really naturally bad at trying something new, but keeping all other variables the same. So like when someone does a I vegan, agree. exactly, when someone does a vegan diet, just like you said, you don't know if they're starting to actually get more sleep and be more conscious of their overall health. So now you don't know if it's because they're getting more consistent sleep and they've stopped eating the fast food, which is why they feel so much better. Because mm -hmm. the, the big two buzzwords that you hear whenever somebody switches to another diet is, I have so much more energy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the main thing you hear, more energy. So it's like, are you sure that, that more energy is because you're mm -hmm. not eating meat or is it because you're just not eating shit? And the, the kind of quote unquote more energy uh, could be true or it couldn't be further from the truth because if you're consuming less energy, which usually that implies, you know, normally when we're talking about most people, when they go on a diet, they're mm -hmm. usually consuming less food. The only energy we have as human beings are through our uh, macronutrients and our calories. So you, you also, I mean, I guess you could say like you might be gaining access to other calories because maybe you're burning fat mm -hmm. and uh in talking to joel green he has said that like burning fat feels like therapeutic you know so that could be something that people are you, you don't want to be doing that forever because you can kind of your luck your luck runs out at some point but <laughs> it that'll that'll feel really good maybe mm -hmm. potentially you know being in ketosis might might feel pretty good but if you just think in very basic terms um change is exciting the human body is just really de is really designed for it. Um, you know, it's it's not the it's not the strongest that survive and thrive. It's the ones that can actually adapt. Yeah. So we can be strong and powerful, but if I can't adapt to like what's coming next, then I'm fucked. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. You know. Um, you know, and, and even just trying to take you know some of the stuff that you could do inside the gym, 
and then take it out into the real world. I mean, what if all of a sudden, uh, you know, we had some really crazy climate changes and, you know, I needed to carry a bunch of shit on my back. And it's like, am I going to be able to adapt to that? Am I going to be able to go outside, you know, and it's fucking 30 degrees and snowing and pack up a bunch of stuff and move my family to a spot that is safer or whatever, or, or in 110 degree heat, you know? Yeah that's you know that's that's what the body's designed to do it's designed for adaptation and i think we just get really pumped about change like you may have just like moved or something or you may have uh maybe you got a, a girlfriend or something you know like something could have changed in your life that you're super pumped about and that's revving up your energy levels too yeah but it is uh i don't think we talked about this at all but it is crazy joe rogan how he posted up about the carnivore diet. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's like the main thing he did. Like mm -hmm. he wasn't talking about any other big changes he had in his diet other than just, just eating meat. Um, and his big thing was also uh, more just sus yeah. like sustainable energy. But I think it was cool how he kind of, um, he was specific about, like he talked about this in a podcast too. He said, like my energy is just consistent now. I have no highs, I have no lows. And that's partially because of the lack of like really sugary, like highly refined carbohydrates in your diet that spikes your blood sugar and makes you feel up and down. With meat, it's just, I mean, yeah, you're getting a consistent flow throughout the day. I'd yeah. feel the same way too. Yeah, let's play it and let's uh, let's listen to what he says. I love his abs popping right through his, uh, yep. his shirt. I posted this on IG and on my YouTube as well, talking about it because I just thought it was cool. I did the carnivore diet for all of January. I lost 12 pounds, gained a ton of energy. My energy levels were completely flat the whole month. No ups and downs from crashing after eating. I had a belly. A lot of people made fun of me, fat shamed me. <laughs> I lost all my fat. I lost all the belly. That's crazy. I lost man. my love handles. Um, I don't know if I'm going to keep eating like this, but it was tremendously beneficial and I also have an autoimmune disorder it's called vitiligo and my vitiligo improved I had a bunch of white spots fill in so I don't know I went into this thing thinking this carnivore diet was wacky and uh, I probably would think it's nonsense but this is as good as I felt in a long time and it's just one month so let's uh, talk about a little bit of this for a second so you know if you think about uh there's one thing he says in there that, that I think threw some people off, but I, I want to talk about why I think he may have said it. He said he wasn't sure if he's going to continue doing it. And I think the only reason why he said that is because he has several million people on his back 24 hours a day because he's Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. And so I think Joe Rogan's a smart dude. And from what I know of him, he's a good dude. And I think that he doesn't want to really like disappoint anyone. He doesn't want to like mislead or he doesn't want to take somebody down a road and then ha have him be like, Oh, I'm heading back the other direction, you know, because something happens or some new information comes out. He's a smart guy. And so I think that he probably said that because of what he says afterwards, where he initially thought the diet was wacky. And so I think in his brain, he's probably like, I don't know, like this, like it was, it was really helpful. It was really useful. But am I going to like really eat like this the rest of my life? I think it's pretty weird and pretty strange. But I personally think that he will utilize this diet the rest of his life. I don't think that he's only going to eat meat the rest of his life. Because I think even during this challenge, I think he mentioned on his show that he was still drinking wine and stuff. I don't, and I don't know uh, if that was something he said just once. Or, and I don't know how much he had or whatever, but. I would imagine there would be some other things in there, you know, that he's uh, he's having. And I think that as he moves along, maybe he just likes vegetables. So maybe he'll eat them. But if they continue to help his autoimmune disorder, he will stay as strictly close to the meat as as he can handle, I think. No, I, I agree with you there. Um, one thing that I thought was, I guess, really interesting about his case was the love handles thing that he mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um I, I think you posted about this too before about yourself and your brother Chris. Because like when I think about love handles, like like they don't just go away. There's right. fat there. But I've I've like heard a lot of people mentioning, oh, these love handles that I've had problems with for years are gone. So I'm just like, it's not like you lose fat that fast. Right. But what is going on there with love handles specifically? <laughs> yeah. That I keep hearing people talk about their love handles in this short period of time. Right. Do you, do you have any ideas there? Because you meant, like you said, mm -hmm. your love handles have somehow improved, yeah. but you've been really lean before. So right. what's the difference? I think for me, that's usually where I hold fat and it's like the place where it wants to come off like last, you uh -huh. know? Okay. 
like my arms will kind of lean out, shoulders will lean out, and even like my legs will start to lean out. And then, <clears throat> then for some reason, I hold some weight right there. And uh, I think for some other people, it's just like a little bit of a stubborn area. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I can't just say that like the carnivore diet specifically is going to help with like quote unquote stubborn body fat. However, it's probably doing some stuff to your uh, hormones that is uh, allowing you to release some body fat that uh, otherwise was uh, stagnant, was staying there. But I also think it might have to do with like something um, something more simple than the simple release of body fat. I agree with you that like it's not just going to all of a sudden shrink up out of nowhere because mine was like in a couple of days too. Joe's was in, like, he was talking about, like, the, the full month, I think, but uh, I noticed some drastic differences within, like, a two-week time span, and I think what it is is I think it's a reduction of, like, inflammation, it's mm. a reduction of uh, maybe maybe even just some water weight, like, maybe, I don't really uh, have a full understanding of how fat cells work, but if I was to take a guess, I would imagine that they are probably dependent on some hydration mm -hmm. and so maybe they're just for lack of a better term deflating a little bit because i know that if i was to go back to um even just a few days of like you know trying to bring in some like carbohydrates or not even carbohydrates but just a lot of overeating that they would uh come back as quickly as they left probably yeah and i think it's honestly i think if you're still really on the fence about trying carnivore i've mentioned this before like personally i don't do like i never did the carnivore diet to I never, I guess I never was like, oh, I'm going to do the carnivore diet. I just had some days where I was like, I really don't feel like eating carbs today. So I didn't eat any carbs and I just pretty much ate meat and, and fat and stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And I did notice like I felt really good on those days. On the days that I would add some carbohydrates, it was mainly for like a workout that I'd be doing the next day or whatever. But I felt, I feel really good on days that I don't eat carbs. And that's actually a lot more days than one would expect now. Mm -hmm. So it would be just a good idea if you wanted to dip your toes in, because I'm, I'm assuming now a lot of the listeners have done World Carnivore Month. For those of you who like just never really thought of it, just give it a shot because it's surprising how good you feel just like not eating carbs just to even try to be like meat based yeah you know? like, they mm. keep saying plant based like why not try to just be when i think about meat based it's like well how long have i been doing that diet for you know i've been doing that diet since i was uh 15 probably you know mm -hmm. because even when i did my bodybuilding show there was tons of meat there was more meat in every meal than there was anything else yeah. you know there was there it was always a good you know it was always a good serving of of meat and everything no matter whether i was powerlifting or even when i was powerlifting even when i was my absolute fattest even when mm -hmm. i was 330 pounds um you know i don't want to say that i ate clean but i ate healthy in accordance to making sure my performance was taken care of so i would always eat a lot of protein i was like i weigh 330 like i'm getting in three four hundred grams of protein like that will be taken care of every day and then whatever other massive destruction i want to cause Maybe I'll leave some room for that, you know, mm -hmm. with some pizza and stuff like that. Mm, the good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say also, like, yeah, doing it just for one day, you'll notice right away. So I went strict carnivore on Saturday because I knew I was going to get weird for the Super Bowl on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so wouldn't recommend doing that too often. But I will say you'll notice right away that you do not feel any bloat whatsoever. Oh, for sure. Like, I mean, I had at, at one meal, I had, it was, I, I lost track, but it was over a pound and a half of steak. And I follow that up with, um, cause I have a hard time like feeling satisfied. I'm full, but I like, I'm like, oh man, I, I need something else. So I, d I made, um, scrambled eggs right after. So I had six eggs after that. Then I started slowing down, but I got up and I felt fine. Um, went to a restaurant for dinner with the family and I just got, um, like more steak and chicken and I mm -hmm. ate just that. Cause I, I have on a carnivore day, I find that if I have one thing, oh, sorry. And I did have chicken with the uh, pound and a half of steak. Um, if I have one just type of like, uh, meat, yeah, type of meat, but, um, what's the word? Um, the chewiness, I can't think of it right now. Just mouth pleasure. Yeah. The mouth pleasure. If I mix it with something else, that's just a different texture. There's the damn word. <laughs> it's sort of like I'm getting my sides in, mm. you know, it's like, uh, your steak and potatoes. It's like, well, steak and chicken. Yeah. Like it's, that's what it is. And so I did the exact same thing for dinner that night. And I just, I kept eating, I kept going to town and I got up and I'm like, dude, I feel great right now. I don't feel like shit. The following day, I had some chips and salsa, I had some guac, and, you know, I had um, uh, those homemade peanut butter cups that I brought in today to get rid of them. Oh, God. Um, after that, dude, I just, I had a headache. I just didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. Like, I just, 
I enjoyed myself, but I didn't feel awesome the way I did before. Yeah. Some of what you're talking about too, how, um, like if you, if you cook up some bacon, you know, you have some bacon or some sausage or something like that, it's going to make eating the other meat a little easier, especially because mm -hmm. of the fat, especially mm -hmm. chicken. Because mm -hmm. chicken just doesn't really have that much fat. So you have, you, you slice up some bacon and you, on every forkful, mm -hmm. yeah, or you could wrap it around there, yeah, <laughs> or every uh, forkful, you know, you got a little, little chunk of bacon on there. I was listening to somebody the other day. Uh, I needed to go back and listen to the podcast to get the guy's name, but the guy, um, he was doing a vegan diet and he just said, but F it at one point. And he like went to the store and bought bacon and he cooked up bacon and his wife like, are you cooking bacon? And she got all pumped and he was like, yep. <laughs> and so that he just out of nowhere, just his own experiment decided like to cook up a bunch of bacon. Like he wanted just to eat bacon. So he ate bacon that night and the next day he was like, I'm going to make more bacon. And so he's just stuck to eating bacon, but bacon is like so savory. And so, um, it, it gets to be too much to handle, right? Like, yeah. like we all love like chocolate and stuff, but like you is as, as delicious as chocolate is. And as much as we want to believe that we could never have enough of it, you'll get to a point where you start to tap out, you get like really thirsty and it's just, I don't know, weird, some weird shit happens, you know, if you have too much of, of anything really. And this guy, Anyway, he just starts going on a bacon diet, and he lost like 70 pounds. Holy crap. He would eat two things of bacon every day. So he would cook up, you know, it's two pounds of bacon, but it shrivels down to be much less food. And I can't even imagine, like, how many calories are in there. It's probably not that much. And yeah. If that's all you eat. If that's ate. all you're eating, yeah. Um, wow. But, like, yeah, it's that's a different thing, right? It's a different style of diet, but. Super interesting the way that people are, are coming to these conclusions. And, um, you know, one thing is for sure is that we don't necessarily need uh, dietary carbohydrates, but um, we have been told, we have been taught, we have been shown, we have been, uh, it's been illustrated everywhere we go, you know, um, for many, many years that like we need like 60% of our diet to come from carbohydrates. And when you use the word need, it's like, well, maybe some people might need it in terms of trying to reach a specific goal, but there's there, humans don't have a requirement for dietary carbohydrates. It's just something to like, no, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, we do have a requirement for uh, magnesium. We do have a requirement for sodium. We do have a requirement for protein. We do have a requirement for fat. We got a, a, a wide variety of things that need to be filled up every single day. Um, Carbohydrates just aren't one of them. Your body will your body will uh, make glucose. Just attempt eating low amounts of like really low amounts of fat for just try it for two or three days. <laughs> I'm not, I I really don't want you guys to try this, but you'd be so hungry. <laughs> you'd be so hungry. You'd be so mad. Yeah. Like 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 literally, you you're gonna feel like absolute shit just because fat just plays such a massive role in almost everything hormonally. You'll feel like crap. You know. So yeah. It's just how it is. It's just be eating nonstop too. Oh yeah, dude. Speaking yeah. of being mad, uh, <laughs> let's oh. let's play this clip. So, our buddy uh, Paul Saladino, Sal Paladino, as we like to call him, <laughs> our buddy Paul, um, he just got you know annihilated on the show for trying to speak his mind. And uh, I think the name of the show is called The Lawyers, The Doctors. Oh, the, the Doctors. Oh. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. There but go. there was a lawyer on it. Right, right. And so that's yeah, that's who he gets into uh, argument with, right? Anyway, let's uh, let's roll the clip roll and the then team. we'll uh, talk about see what you guys think. Doctor Saladino, when you're recommending this diet, what risks do you discuss with your patients? I don't think there are any risks to eating animal foods exclusively. There are no risks in terms of kidney function. Mm -hmm. There are many studies which show that high protein diets do not affect kidney function. Mm -hmm. There are no studies interventionally that show that eating meat is going to increase the risk of any single cancer. There are no risks to eating the foods that we have been eating as humans for our entire existence. As an attorney, I would ask you, you're a medical doctor, is Absolutely. that correct? Absolutely. And you are a psychiatrist, am right, I correct? Right, a residency in psychiatry. So what do you know about nutrition? What is Where did you gain your background in nutrition? Listen, this is, I think... No, is you listen to me and answer my question. Now I'm asking you I'm to tell us where your background emanates from. I went to medical school and I studied nutrition in medical school, yeah. and I studied nutrition independently. One of the crazy things about medical school is that it teaches you how to read articles. 
I'm a doctor. I know how to read articles. So have you I know done how any to read the independent literature. testing? Have you written any articles that was as suggested by the physicians who've been here today? What does writing articles have to do with my well, knowledge? Well, nutrition? because I could become you. I could be you as an expert because I read all of the data and all of the um, <laughs> articles on this subject. Now I'm an expert? That doesn't make me an expert. With and the I proper background and with the medical training, like, medicine needs to think about teaching doctors more nutrition in medical school. I agree but with that. But it is up to us to educate ourselves. Just because there's a degree that says a doctor doesn't mean that we have or don't have medical nutritional knowledge. The bottom line fair. is you practice psychiatry. Am I correct? I practice medicine. I you think practice the, psychiatry. I is that correct? I practice medicine. So what makes you an expert in this? Because an expert in what? An expert in understanding human physiology? This is medicine. The separation of humans into organ systems doesn't serve the patient. To say that because I'm a psychiatrist, I don't know about nutrition is a completely... I didn't say that. That's Your what you were inferring. Is That's what you were mind. inferring. Well, where does the inflammation come from that causes depression and anxiety? It comes from the body. It doesn't come from the brain. It's a scary thought process that is all you need to do is read articles to make you an expert. How I want to know what kind of testing you've done, what kind of data you have, what you yourself have found regarding these issues. I'm not sure. Other I'm, than what reliance is on other people's I'm not fighting. sure I understand your question because that's how You don't want to listen to my question because I'm, you know I'm right. No, me, you're wrong. Can I ask you a question? What, when you talk about the animal diet, Wait when, a second. when you I talk about... I given the floor to respond to this. This isn't fair. Okay. Right? Anyone gathers fair. data by reading articles. Anyone gathers data by learning. What you're suggesting is not a fair criticism of me. Dr. Saladino, <laughs> when you're recommending... Oh, my God. Kind of a lot to talk about on this one. Um, <laughs> <She is> infuriating. <laughs> yeah, oh. yeah. She's, uh, she's very mad. First of all, you know, <laughs> asking, uh, asking questions is great, you know? Uh, asking them like that isn't because then it causes too much tension and it causes like a fight and then you don't ever get an opportunity to learn anything. Obviously, you know, she has a show, you know, and so she's probably, I, I, I don't know who that woman is. I've never seen her before. She's probably antagonistic kind of all the time. It's mm. probably part of her role on the show. And she <laughs> fucking did a great job of it right there. Right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you, but you know, when it comes to these, uh, when it comes to nutrition, there hasn't been, so there's been people who have studied it for a long time. And, and I I'm going to say the same thing about um, the environment. Um, my dad, when I was a kid, he pointed to the trees one time. He's like, you see those trees over there on that mountain? Because I asked him, I was like, oh, we're learning about, you know, the environment in school. Like, what do you think about this? I can't even remember what it was, greenhouse effects or whatever. I can't, I can't remember. Ozone layer, whatever. I ask him this question. My dad, you know, my dad has all the answers. My dad's n never the guy to say he doesn't know. Okay. <laughs> Which is the opposite of me. I'm always like, you know what? I'm not really sure. Like, let me, <laughs> let me check on that and I'll get back to you. But my dad, you know, he kind of thinks he has everything figured out. But <clears throat> anyway, he points to the trees that are on this like mountaintop where I lived. I lived in an area where there's tons of trees and tons of like woods and there was deer everywhere and stuff like that. We kind of had like a lived in like the country almost but not not uh not like you would picture like uh cows and that kind of stuff it was more like woods you mm. know anyway uh he points to the trees and he goes you see those trees over there he's like if we brought a bunch of people out in the woods and we had chainsaws and we chopped down all those trees he goes by the time we get to that other mountain over there and by the time we make our way back to <laughs> to where the trees were that we chopped down He's like, new shit would be growing over there. He's like, that's the way nature is. He goes, the environment's indestructible. And I kind of thought he was crazy because I'm like learning the stuff in school. You know, like kind of like my kids think I'm crazy when I say certain things. Like people don't say those kinds of things anymore. People don't think like that anymore. Yeah. Um, and hopefully later on they, fail, they find out I was right about some stuff at least. Um, anyway, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 years go by. I'm, I'm watching the Discovery Channel. My dad always loved watching that. So even when I moved out of the house and like just chill on my sofa and watch TV, uh, I'd watch that kind of stuff. And uh, they're talking about the environment. It's like one expert after another expert after another expert after another expert. One guy comes on and he goes, you know what we found? He's like, we've been studying this, you know, combined amongst, you know, the four or five of us for a hundred something years. And he goes... 
what we discovered is we pretty much think the environment is indestructible. <laughs> <laughs> my, my phone rings before the guy finishes the sentence, and I go, I'm watching the same show. My dad's like, see? <clears throat> anyway, oh, uh, <laughs> the, the point of that story is this, is that when it comes to nutrition and when it comes to the environment, it doesn't seem like we have moved forward from the very basics. We don't know anything more than we did a few hundred years ago. The stuff that your grandmother used to say about like, don't spoil your dinner, don't eat after this time, uh, you know, all these things where you're like, I don't understand. That doesn't make any sense. Don't spoil my dinner. I'm eating two hours before I eat. Mm -hmm. Well, now we know that you're interrupting your fast. And now we know that if you eat snacks, you might be snack minded rather than meat minded, which could put you in a category uh, where you may potentially uh, do a lot of things that negatively impact your metabolism, such as overeating, which is probably the toughest thing to overcome because you're not focused in on the proper nutrients that the body actually needs. Um, you know, uh, not eating after a certain time. We know that the time, or at least we thought we knew that the time didn't matter, but now there's actually more research and more information coming out all the time about there could be like uh, things attached to like your circadian rhythm and when you eat and this kind of thing. But even beyond that, it's just another form of some fasting, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, getting on board with uh, some intermittent fasting and you could be, you're, you're interrupting your ability to maybe potentially get more bang for your buck by eating more of whatever grandma or your mom or whoever cooked for dinner because dinner usually has meat in it. You know, not all the time, but almost all the time. And it doesn't matter the ethnicity. There's usually some sort of meat involved or broth or something that's very nutritious Occasionally, it could be like an all-carb thing. It could be like pasta and bread. Mm -hmm. But even that, there's usually like a meat sauce in there or something. Mm -hmm. You're going to get some influence of, uh, of meat. Going to this CrossFit seminar and hearing people talk about the environment, um, environmental concerns in terms of like cattle and environmental concerns in, in terms of, uh, you know, the cattle like farting and these kinds of things, right? Or These are all have been things that have been uh, shown to be very overblown, how the animals are cared for and how they're fed seem to be a larger concern. But really, all it is is like going back to our roots from a few hundred years ago. If we just live the way that we're supposed to live and live within reason, then everything seems like it's going to uh, work out a lot better. And then in terms of the nutrition, I turned to a guy at the seminar and said, it doesn't seem like we've gotten anywhere. It really doesn't. It's like, it's cool that there was presenters there and it's cool that they shared all this great information, but nobody had anything all that different to say. Someone could get up there and they could talk about ketones and they could talk about how they think uh, nutrition could be used as medicine against like autism and these different things. But we, we basically already know that a lot of the things we've been doing to our body is very dangerous and very hazardous and it has been hurting us in many, many different ways. And it's um, and my, from where I sit and from where I stand and the observations I've made and the people I've hung out with, which in my opinion has been some of the best people in the nutrition space, there's not, there's not really any new information, uh, there's not any new research rather, that tells us anything that we probably didn't know uh, from a few million years ago. Yeah. That like, you know, they knew that eating meat was important. I mean, even just think about this, this was something that was in Game Changers. They thought, they claimed in, in Game Changers that we ate vegetables, like we evolved to like eat vegetables and primarily survive with vegetables. Mm -hmm. That definitely is not the case and that definitely is very false. I'm not against vegetables. I think that they can be great for you. I, I, they're, they're okay to eat. I don't, don't have an issue with them. But what separates human beings out from other animals, from other species, is that we are the apex predator. We can dismantle, I know this might sound rude and it might sound weird, we can dismantle any animal on the planet, no matter how big it is and how ferocious it is, in a way that no other animal can do. We can kill it with a spear, we can kill it with a knife, we can shoot it, we can get it from a safe distance that doesn't negatively hurt us, doesn't impact us. You could throw a spear from a little bit away and, and kill it, right? There's even tribes that used to drive off lions because lions would kill an animal. They would sit there and they would watch them, you know, and when the lions got fed and when they weren't so ferocious, they would scare the animals away. Yeah. They'd take the carcass, 
they'd cut out some of the meat and you know what they would do? They would go for the brains. They would go for the liver. They would get a bunch of shit from the animal that the other animals couldn't get to. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how strong a lion is. He's not getting to the brains of a zebra. You know, he can't figure that out. It's, it's encased. It's encased in a, in a skull. But a human could cut it open and learn how to do all that and turn the thing into, uh, you know, something that helps keep them warm and all these different things. On top of that, you're not going to see a fucking lion by a campfire, <laughs> you know, cooking something, right? Human beings have the ability to cook. And when you cook, you change some of the nutrient profile and you also kill off some of the dangerous things that should that are potentially in there. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody in the world that doesn't think that all those things like match up? Like there shouldn't be. <clears throat> like we're, I think we're talking to some maybe humans that are uh, maybe not having an understanding of of like how we evolved and where we came from. If that's the case, because to me, all that really lines up for me. Yeah. Um, first off, on the the. Like what you're talking about with the um, people chasing off the lions. There's a really cool video. I don't know if you guys have seen it of like this tribe or like yeah, they're, they're I think these it's from a documentary. I think it might have been from a documentary. Yeah, like like this group of individuals ran up to a lion and they scared them and they started just cutting it up and they had to do that just for long enough to get the meat and scurry away. Right? Yeah. They scared off lions like that. That that was pretty crazy. But what I was also going to mention, man, was <sighs> this frustrated me a lot. I have a guy that I go to jujitsu with. I'm not going to name him just because uh, I like. I don't know if he'd be okay with me doing that. But this is positive on his part. He's lost a lot of weight. Okay, he started implementing some fasting. He started implementing some uh, utilizing some of the carnivore diet. He still makes mistakes here and there in terms of like overeating. And his overeating generally comes from junk carbs, like like especially when he has snacks in his house. Like that. That's what happens. So he's very aware of that. Oh uh, yeah, I think this is the this is the video too. Oh yeah. Or part of it. But anyway, so after a year, he comes back to his doctor and all his blood markers are better. Even like the, the year before, the doctor said that there's there's something specific about the amount of protein in his blood. He's not sure what it's called. But even that went down, even though he's eating more protein. And the doctor's like, yo, dude, what have you been doing? And he said, yeah, I've been doing a lot of fasting. I've been eating much more meat. I've, I'm not snacking as much or eating as much sugar in terms of junk carbs, etc." And the doctor's like, where's your vegetables and then he was like oh, man, i'm eating some but not much he's like well you know i mean even though everything's gotten so much better you need to probably lower the amount of meat you're eating it's probably not a good idea that was the first place that doctor mm -hmm. went to and and the the like my friend from jujitsu he's like but everything everything's better like why 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 should i eat less meat if everything's better he's like it's just not good for you you should probably get more fiber in your diet i think he said that his doctor is very is plant-based and his doctor is trying to convince him mm -hmm. to go plant-based even though everything has improved so drastically right. and it's in the numbers but because this individual is so dogmatic in his approach it doesn't matter like this is what you need to do you know, right. and that that is first off, it's scary that that's coming from a doctor. But when an individual is so dogmatic behind a certain diet that even when someone's improving, they cannot see the benefit in what that individual is doing, that is scary. And it's more so just scary and frustrating because that's his healthcare practitioner, that's his doctor that he's going to. It's just just like the the fucking show. You know yeah. what I mean? Like those interviewers, nothing what Paul, what, nothing what that Doctor Saladino was saying was inflammatory or or it was all logical mm -hmm. but they have an agenda they have something that no matter right. what they're trying to put mm -hmm. forward and if it doesn't line up with what they what they're you know putting forward it, it, it's wrong right and he also you know i from what i recall of what he was saying i think he said he believed he's like i believe this i believe that which is different than saying like he didn't he he definitely has evidence you know you don't ever really have like full-on like proof you know we got we we got like hypothesis, right? Like, this is what I think based of all based off of all this evidence. This mm -hmm. is what I have come up with. And then once you start to see people like your friend having these testimonials, uh, that's where so that's where being a doctor can be complicated, because you know a doctor could say, you know what, I I don't know if I agree with that, but look, man, your blood's getting better, so. You know, let's not really make any changes. Now, you being a bodybuilding coach and a powerlifting coach, if you're working with somebody and they call you up and they're like, hey, man, like, I know you told me to switch over to this other thing, but I just kept doing this other workout 
and like I'm getting shredded and super strong. Why change? You'd be like, dude, you're killing it. Congratulations. Like, and you might have another suggestion that may help just as an add on, but you're not gonna be like, no, dude, like you need to do what I've learned. Like, Mm -hmm. that's the only thing. It's gotta be concrete. And I actually feel like I'm excited that I don't have uh, letters after my name because I think that that stuff or before your name, that stuff can can screw you up because then you're uh, pigeonholed into saying certain things because you have a practice. Um, and I, I would never want anybody to get hurt. I'm not ever trying to promote anything that I believe would hurt anybody. I'm only trying to promote information that I'm hearing and that I'm deciphering and saying like, okay, this is this has worked really good for me. And I've passed the ball off to somebody else and it works really good for them. And then it mm-hmm. works really good for this person. And usually, usually I don't say much of anything until things are working for a while. Like I've been doing this diet for like three years and I've been meat based, I think for 20 years, you know, eating, you know, large amounts of meat almost every single day uh, of my life for a really long time. And I've seen it help so many different people. And so I think, you know, when you get, um, someone like Paul Saladino on there getting grilled is super unfortunate because it was great that the woman was trying to ask questions, but then she wasn't really getting any anywhere. She was just being inflammatory and she wasn't saying, okay, it's your belief that uh, meat is not dangerous. That's the opposite of what I heard. Can you explain why you, you don't think it's dangerous? That would have been awesome. Mm-hmm. And then people could have learned from it, but then it wouldn't have turned into what it turned into and we wouldn't be talking about it right now either. People aren't coming into these conversations with actually trying to find solutions. They're trying to come into these conversations with, a, with that idea to try to prove their, their idea, not to find out more, not to understand more. I think that's, that's a really cool thing about like, first off, I guess a lot of the people we talk to, including Sean Baker, because even when you talk to Sean Baker, right? Uh, I've asked him like, well, you know, if you're doing okay with some of these carbs or some of these vegetables, is there really a reason to have to take them out? No, no, there isn't. You can have some of that stuff. You know what I mean? But he does go into why certain things might not be ideal. You know what I mean? So it's, there's, there's, re- I don't like when you talk to those guys, you can kind of tell they don't have an agenda to, for the world to not eat vegetables, mm-hmm. right? It's just something is working so well for themselves and not just themselves, the hundreds, if not thousands of people that are also doing it. And I think that's one thing that's kind of messed up is that people tend to, I guess, uh, undermine anecdotal evidence the results of a lot of other people that are doing this with improved health markers and that that are just getting better it's like that doesn't matter because there hasn't been a a research paper that proves this to be legitimate even though all the other research that's been done on meat it's been kind of fucked up we found out so absolutely i think you know even when it comes to an expert you know that's what she kept harping on um and then she couldn't say you're not a doctor because he is a doctor. He's a doctor. But she kept saying that he's not an expert, and it's very clear that Paul has a, uh, a a wide array of understanding of a lot of the things when it comes to the human body, and that he uh, is one of the smarter people in the space when it comes to nutrition and mm-hmm. when it comes to the carnivore diet specifically. Uh, him and Dr. Baker are just next level. They remember every study. They remember all this information. Uh, not only that, they're able to take complicated and complex issues. Um, if I was just a guess, I, I would say that Paul's um, like IQ is probably off the charts. Like he's one of the smarter people that we've ever had in the studio. And I would say the same is true with Dr. Baker. I mean, we've been around some people where we're like, oh man, like that guy didn't have much to say. He wasn't he wasn't that in tune with what was going on. We've had other people where we're like, holy shit, man, like that was some crazy stuff. I couldn't keep up with that guy. I wish I knew what the hell he was talking about. Mm-hmm. But these guys, not only do they have that side of them where you don't know what they're talking about, they're able to break a lot of it down. And that's a sign of somebody that has some genius in them. And I think that these are really brilliant people. And I, you know, I hope that they can get uh, listened to more. And I hope that, you know, for Paul's sake, I hope that he ends up on Joe Rogan. Because I think that would be an amazing platform for him to share all this information. I feel like he's got different information than kind of anybody else out there. Yeah. And this is this is part of it too. Why did she keep going on about him writing articles? Mm-hmm. What articles have you written? Is that what she, she was yeah, saying? Yeah. Yeah. And then what 
Because I, I, her argument was like, well, since you haven't written any any articles, which he has, by the way, he's written tons of articles. But what the but fuck does that? I mean? think like stuff that's like peer reviewed and whatnot, ah, like the, okay. on so Pub MD like, and all that okay. good stuff. So her argument was like, well, since you haven't written any articles, mm. I can be you. Yeah, right. which is couldn't that's be so far a... from the truth. Like just because you, you know what I mean. So I think that's that was her argument, but she was just. That's such a horrible it's, argument. It's a really bad argument, especially coming from an attorney, because he could easily go to law school and become her. It's actually like, she's got <laughs> it backwards, you know what I mean? Because yeah. to try to be him, it would be really hard because he's done things in such an unconventional way. To try to be her would actually be very easy. How many Paul Saladinos are there in the country? Like, there's five people that know about the carnivore diet the way that he does, right? Mm. How many lawyers are there? <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's a ton. There's a blueprint for that. You go to school and you spend a bunch of money on being an attorney, mm-hmm. and you, you know, you get, it's hard. It's not going to be easy, but yeah, Andrew, people have done it. Can you go to Paul's page again, real quick, and pull up the very first video he showed? Did you see that one too? It was also from the doctors. Mm. Um, and the reason why I want him to pull that one up, along with this one that we just saw, is just because you can see, I guess how much emotion is just behind these individuals. Mm-hmm. Like It's like they're, they're not even trying to talk logically at this point. It's just they feel a certain way, so they blurt about it without... You know, like this, this. I just think, uh, before you play it for a second, um, I think that the vegan stuff is a softer, easier conversation amongst family members and amongst friends. Yeah. You know, it's a little bit like talking about Donald Trump. You feel like if you talk about Donald Trump, then people are going to just, they're going to lose their mind. They're going to hate you. They're going to want to burn down your house, you know? Mm -hmm. And I feel the same way with meat. Sometimes you feel like, man, if I mention this to people, they're going to really be, they're going to really be like uneasy, right? They're going to be like super upset. By the way, I just got to throw this in. Uh, Donald Trump is amazing. Oh, no. He said something so funny the other day. Uh, he talked about all these things that are going on in the United States and all these positive, and he uh-huh. goes, and here I am, I'm being impeached. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one of the greatest presidential quotes of all time. Oh, He's got a good point. Yo, Andrew, also, before you play that real quick, <laughs> dude, no, on, on that emotional side of things, like when there are some people in my life that when I say, you know, meat isn't unhealthy, immediately the fire starts to rise, and you could see, like, they're getting mad, and then... Before I get to say anything more, you're like, no, meat's been proven. And like, I, I just like, I can't get words mm-hmm. in with some people. And it really is just like, I, I, I just, I just can't talk to you, I guess. You know, it's just, it's really that important for people. But I mean, cause I'm trying to remember when it was where I realized like, or not, I realized I was taught like meat was kind of bad and it was in sixth grade. Mm. I think I talked about it on this show before, but. I remember they're saying like for somebody your size and your activity level, you should be eating uh, one piece of meat the size of your palm per day. I mean, like, man, uh, and in my head, I'm like, dude, I have like like four tacos. Like that's way more than mm. like. That's actually interesting though, because if it's bad, why would you have any of it? Yeah, <laughs> you know. But just so I mean, just when it comes to like, why are people like saying that it's so you bad? You wouldn't say that about a tortilla. You know, you should have you should have you mm. know two tortillas that are the size of your hand every day. It's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 uh it's definitely weird. And luckily for me, I was never I've never been taught that. You know, I because I was in like powerlifting and bodybuilding, I always kind of knew that like meat had to be part of your thing. Otherwise, you couldn't do the sport that mm. I love to do so much. Yeah. Let's let her rip. It's just meat. That's not good. I don't have to be a doctor. I'm just like, I'm blown away right now. I mean, it's just like a like okay. a 13 year old child's <laughs> response, right? It's like ah, emotion. <laughs> this is what? this is Hollywood, right? This I'm is what gets views. Uh, this is what get, gets views in Hollywood. You know, like there's no science in that statement. He said there are thousands and thousands of studies showing benefit, and I said to what? And he said fruits and vegetables. Well, as I showed you in this, that's not true, actually. Um, there are very few studies which show benefits to fruits and vegetables. Again, he might be referring to epidemiology, which is likely confounded by healthy user bias. I don't actually know what he's referring to because it's not a debate. It's just, it's just comedy. It's just theater. And as we discussed at the beginning of this uh, video, there are many studies which do not show a benefit to fruits and vegetables. And the carnivore diet itself 
is so challenging to people because the carnivore diet suggests that in a lot of people, eliminating fruits and vegetables can be beneficial. So we have now thousands of case studies, many of which are published, right? Paleo Medicinas did a great job of publishing many case studies of people doing much better on carnivore diets. I would encourage people to check out their stuff. It's indexed there. They have published case studies of ulcerative colitis, or at least Crohn's. They've published case studies of Crohn's, cervical cancer, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, um, I think it's rectal cancer, and perhaps uh, glioblastoma multiforme, which is a brain cancer. So there are so many anecdotes and now published case reports suggesting that the removal of fruits and vegetables can be beneficial to humans, that we cannot ignore this. This is what the carnivore diet and the movement is so about. Like, we can't ignore that some people get better when you take out plants. Mm. And now we have Travis Stork throwing up his hands and saying, there are thousands of studies. This can't possibly be good for you. I ate meat last night. I'm not, a, I don't even need to be a doctor. I just don't even know what to think about this right now. In this, uh, in this modern day, you know, just by the way, in this modern day, it's like pretty impossible to get by with only meat. Mm. And so, um, and one, a person can just kind of infer that if you were to say, you know what, I'm going to be carnivore the rest of my life, that you would probably have uh, some ice cream cake on your birthday. You would probably have uh, a beer. You'd probably have a pizza. Like, I, I think that, I think that, you know, of course we were designed to eat only meat, but we have like modern conveniences of having some really delicious stuff. And because food is so tied in with entertainment, um, it kind of sucks to always have to have a specific schedule, especially, especially for me, because it, it impacts everybody around me too. Um, you know, it's not like I'm smoking a cigarette and blowing smoke in everybody's face, but it, it is, a it is a little annoying when everyone else is kind of letting loose and enjoying themselves and you're being all tight and all strict, right? Um, it's kind of like, you know, if a, a group of friends wants to go out and they're all drinking, but you're the one person that's not doing it. Mm -hmm. It's just, a, it changes the dynamic a little bit. So, you know, in, in those terms, like it, I don't think it makes any sense to go your whole life and, and not um, enjoy yourself. But if you uh, are somebody that would rather enjoy just sticking to the diet all the time, which <laughs> yeah. that's possible. We've had people on the show that are like that. Then I think that that would be, that might be something that you, you know, would want to do. Dude, you know, okay. Prior to us doing this episode, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about carnivore before, but I don't think I've ever heard somebody use the term meat-based. I might be wrong, but I, like, I haven't heard any of them say meat-based. Like, that's, that's pretty much what, like, what I've been doing. Like, I'm on a meat-based diet. Like, I'll have certain shit here and there, but I'm eating a lot of meat throughout all I of it. I started using it because I got tired of people being like, that's not carnivore. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, uh, you know, I'm going to mix in other stuff here and there. Like I'm not a, I'm not a robot, you know? I think, yeah, I think we, cause like, yeah, I'm like, according to that definition, I'm meat based, you know? And it makes a lot of sense, but I love it because no honestly, need to worry because you know, got, you guys know, I already bought the website. So. <laughs> <laughs> really? I did. Yeah. Oh, you did? Mm -hmm. boy. Oh, snap. Yeah. It's like meatbase.com. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't know. I hope so now. I bought a couple we're live. Them, I <laughs> He's bought a bunch of domains. <laughs> oh, man. But um, yeah, I, I think I love that term also because it's extremely triggering. Right. It's extremely triggering. So, hey, nice. Yeah. You know, and, and I think, uh, you know, to, to go off of that, what that guy like losing his mind, right? Um, what's interesting is that and it, it's hard, you know, people get so upset with generalizing, you know, and people get so, hard, so upset about, I guess I could explain it this way. Uh, very specific tips and very specific things are coaching tools. And that's why they exist, you know, um, like the weighing of your food and your caloric intake. And so your coach, it's really nice for your coach to have a guideline to be like, hey, 75 grams of carbs. Let's see what happens. Send me pictures. The coach now has photos of the way that you look in accordance to what they designed for you to eat every time. Mm -hmm. There's no app, there's no coach, there's no nothing, you know, in our evolution uh, that m makes that make any sense, except for in the scenario of you ate too much other junk in your life, you're in a position where you want to get in better shape or you're trying to get ready for a bodybuilding show because that's what you love to do. Um, but 
from an evolutionary standpoint, we didn't have apps. We didn't have food scales. We didn't have a coach saying you need to increase your uh, carbs. You didn't have anything like that. And when we were in that time, we didn't have any issues. We, we didn't have as many issues. 88% of the population didn't have metabolic disease like they have now. That means you know, only 12% of the population has full access to what your body is supposed to be able to do. Yeah. And that sucks. That's that's terrible. So before, like, I'm not saying that counting calories by any means, it didn't cause that. But I want to point out that the reason why that exists is because people need that nowadays because there's so much other stuff around that if you can have it fit your macros, if you can ha utilize some flexible dieting, it might be beneficial because you need a bunch of rules to follow. Whereas in years past, we didn't have to have rules because there was no like dietary rules. You would kill an animal, you would chop it up, you would maybe heat it up, and then you would eat it. And you would just eat as much as you could and you'd share stuff with uh, the other people that were there. But anyone, any single person, other than like, again, I think there's only a real rare case. There's people that have been bitten by a tick that are allergic to certain types of meat. Um, as far as like, there's there's tons of food allergies and there's none to meat except for for those people that got bit by that bug um and i've had people write in that have been bit by that bug it's a weird it's a weird fucking thing yeah anyway uh besides the lone star tick or whatever that damn thing is mm -hmm. every single person in america would be healthier if they just only ate meat yeah. and it might take some time they might have to adjust they might have to figure out how to, uh, you know, start to eat less because maybe they have a crazy ferocious appetite and maybe uh, they can still figure out a way to eat way too much food, which that would still be uh, having a negative impact on your nutrition, on your health. But even if you were to ab able to do that, uh, because of the protein in meat, it would just be super, super hard and it would be super rare. Yeah, you know, I think you could put up, you know, however many million Americans are, are here that are, you know, uh, above the age of like five, you know, and stick them on a carnivore diet. Uh, every the only thing people would lose is weight, and the only <laughs> thing people would lose, uh, or the only thing people would gain is their health. Yeah, no, you 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 can't overeat on that diet, most definitely. But it's it's uh, convenience too. Like that's part of that's part of modern day life. That's one of the reasons why we're so messed up. Like all of these foods are super convenient to eat: chips, all these packaged foods. You like. Again, that is why weighing food and that's why that stuff becomes so useful because now you need those tools to put yourself in line. If you try to eat naturally, if you just try to follow your appetite because of like the way, well, yeah, because of like the way food is packaged, because of how, how highly refined it is, because they want, it's made for you to eat more of it. You couldn't inherently be eat. very lost. You'd be very lost because your appetite and your your hunger is telling you to eat all these things at all this time. You couldn't do it without like having to potentially weigh certain, especially if you wanted to fit in a lot of fun foods. Right, right. It'd be really difficult to have to do that by just eating it. You'd have to weigh it, make sure it's good in amounts, so you're not in a crazy caloric surplus. You don't have to do that with meat. I think that's something to think about here. Right. You know, people that do a carnivore diet generally. They wouldn't actually, you don't, if you do this diet, I'm, I'd say that most people on it do not need to probably even weigh their food or, mm -hmm. or scale food if you're only eating meat. Because your appetite will, you'll know when to stop eating. You'll feel full. But like, I mean, what would you even like calculate? Like, what are you going to count? You'd count protein and fat because mm -hmm. there's fat in a lot of like the meats you eat. But that, that'd be pretty much it. But like people that are doing their diet, because you get so full so quickly, I'm not saying that you have to do a carnivore diet, by the way, but I'm just saying it is a diet where satiety will trigger or will, will tap in so quick that you'll just stop eating when you're not when you're full and that'll cause you to lose weight but when you are using utilizing flexible dieting and fitting in a lot of other foods that i mean you could probably eat more when you're eating more fruits rice etc that you can overeat on that's when sometimes it's necessary to track because you really can overindulge without even realizing you're overindulging mm -hmm. So that's not me saying you have to do the carnivore diet, but that's me saying what you just said makes a lot of sense. You feel full and you'll stop eating. Even if you over, like let's just say you just started the carnivore diet and the first few days you overeat a little bit on meat, that'll start to slow down. Mm -hmm. you, you're not, you cannot do that for a full week. It's yeah, probably you think about impossible. How, 
how long it would take you to eat um, maybe like a bowl of cereal or a bowl of ice cream versus eating like a, you know, 14 ounce like New York strip. You know, like just what you're saying is that as you're chomping through that New York strip, maybe six minutes went by. I mean, some people are pretty fast eaters. But maybe eight minutes went by or maybe only four minutes went by, but some time has gone by. Eating the cereal, you'll probably eat pretty fast, even if you're not trying to eat it fast, because it's encouraging you to eat it fast because there's so much flavor to it. The ice cream would even be easier because there's no crunch. There's not really anything to really chew. Mm -hmm. You would get through that pretty quickly. But if it's eight minutes later and you still have some more steak to go through, now you're kind of like, man, I've been chewing for a while, you know, like... I think I feel I think I feel pretty good, and you can you can just maybe start to be a little bit more rational. You're like ah, you know what? If I'm still hungry, I'll, I'm going to check in about another ten minutes, which would be twenty minutes, which lines up with what other people have said on this podcast. It takes about twenty minutes to recognize that you're full, mm -hmm. and to recognize that you're satisfied. If you wait another ten minutes and say, all right, well, if I'm still feel really hungry, I'll cook up some eggs, like Andrew did the other day. Then I mean, you're on the right track, you yeah. know, and you're going to automatically start to eat less and. I do get a lot of people ask me about protein, you know, and tracking protein. And I say, I don't, there's, you, there's really not a lot of reasons to track anything because I think that it will just, it will regulate itself when you're only eating meat, you know, because what's going to happen is you're going to have a day where you get after it. And you have By the way, we're talking in the context of trying to lose weight, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, and you're, you're gonna, going to, um, you know, you're, you're going to eat like 300 grams of protein one day, maybe the next day you only get a hundred. Mm-hmm. You know, and it might go up and down. But, yeah, if you're trying to gain weight, um, then I think that it, it can be important to – because so with gaining weight, the hard part for some people is just to eat. They just don't have an appetite that matches up uh, well enough with consuming calories. And then that's where you can use some tricks from our buddy Stan Efforting, and you could utilize insulin uh, to help stimulate uh, some hunger, not – Talking about insulin. dietary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can uh, have a little bit of carbohydrates, and that could help stimulate a little bit of hunger. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and you know, pouring stuff on your food can help, as you know, Stan does with like the bone broth because it loosens it up and makes it a little easier to eat. Stuff like that can really be super beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I've said it before. Like I, I said it in like question form, but like I had to ask you guys, like, who can't this diet help? And you, what you guys are just saying right now is just like it very obviously will help anybody and everybody. Like it's just it's phenomenal. It's, be meat based. Yeah, be meat based. I love that. Yeah, and uh, you know, in our episode, you know, it'd be great for everybody to check out the episodes that we did with uh, Paul Saladino and Dr. Sean Baker. Mm -hmm. um, Paul did mention a subset of people that he had a little bit of a hard time with. Um, but you can check out the information on, on the podcast, but it's like, again, there's always exceptions to every rule. Right. And I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out, you know, a, any of any possibilities, but you know, if you're like, when I, when I'm thinking about diet, you know, for me personally, I, I make the mistake of, of always thinking about heavier people since that seems, I think that's the biggest problem that we face as Americans. Um, it, there's just so many people that are unhealthy and so many people that are, you know, they're just get, there's, it's just getting, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And I hate to see that we're losing the battle. So when I think of diet, I'm so excited to share the information on. I'm always thinking about trying to get people to drop some pounds and to be a little bit healthier. One of the healthiest things a lot of people can do is just to simply reduce some body weight. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because everybody seems to be, well, that, that's why today's episode that we posted was so important is the uh, quote, long-term effects of the carnivore diet. And like, oh, well, there's no proof. There's no this. There's no that. Look around. That's all the proof you need that right now the standard American diet or whatever the hell the diet we're on right now isn't working. Like, I mean, how long has the standard American diet been around for? Like, do we know? Like, do you know, Mark, when it started, like, officially? Yeah, it kind of uh, started to kick off around the time of, like, refrigeration. You know, as soon as you had a fridge in your house, mm -hmm. that's when all hell broke loose. Because <laughs> there was, soda back, a lot there was soda back then. Um, but then you, you know, you just didn't have much access to it. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if you were somebody like, uh, my dad's age, my dad would, dr would ride his bike, you know, until he's old enough to drive his car to the store and he'd pick up a Coke for like him and my mom or whatever. And, but you know, and it was like this magical thing, you know, cause like mm -hmm. no one else had this shit, you know, it was like, 
you'd have it like twice a week, you know? And, yeah. but you know, th th those are weird times too, because like the only, like, uh, I guess the, the everyone's smoking cigarettes. So it's <laughs> like, you know, people were finding their, I guess, finding their fix through other things, which people will probably always do. But I would even say, I mean, I don't know what the stats would show, but I'd even say that people were still probably healthier regardless of the smoking. Uh, just because they didn't have as much negative impact with the food that they're eating. Mm -hmm. Obesity wasn't called an epidemic at that point. No. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you guys think like the, the end all be all argument against the carnivore diet, unless, I mean, there's two doctors that are championing it, right? Paul and uh, Sean Baker, mm -hmm. they're both doctors, but people always point to that too. They're like, well, doctors don't recommend this diet. They always say go plant-based or whatever. Do you think that will always be like the end argument say, from people saying, or people against the diet saying, like, what do you know? Like, you're not like this lady saying, you're not an expert. You're not this, you're not that. It's like, well, shit, man. If I go to my doctor right now, he's going to want to give me prescriptions for something, even though I'm totally fine. Like, he's going to want to inject not, me with something, yeah, right? I'm not, like, what does he know? Yeah, I'm not one for research and, and, and that kind of stuff and, and science, but I think the science helps have stuff move in, in the right direction because people, they need, like, I don't know, they need to be, they need confirmation, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I, I never need that. I, you know, I personally don't, I personally don't need that, but I know a lot of people want, like, assurance that they're, you know, this is the right thing, but... I think it's problematic, you know, to sit around and wait for stuff. You know, it's problematic. One of your cameras is flashing red. I'm not sure. If <laughs> yeah, I'll fix it. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's um, it's problematic to be like waiting around. Like, oh, I'm gonna wait 20 years for the research to hit. It's like, well, I'll, I'll be like in my 60s, so maybe I should just be kind of messing around with it now and and learning, uh, learning for myself what's going on. But I think um, with how many people that are sick. And it's estimated that in 2050, it's going to be a flip of a coin on whether you have dementia or, and al or, or Alzheimer's that with that, with a stat like that floating around, something's got to change. Something's yeah. got to give. Like, imagine if your memory's erased, you, you have, you don't have a life anymore. Like yeah. you're, if you, if you lose your strength and you're in a wheelchair <clears throat> or you had an accident or something, it's like. That's one thing, but at least you can remember, you know, you can remember other stuff. You can remember people's names. You can still interact with people. But if you have to be told who somebody is every day, like you're done. Like that is a torturous uh, disease and it's really negatively impacting a lot of families. And so as that grows um, and also through drugs, we're making people live longer. <laughs> we're like making them live longer. They're mm -hmm. dying longer, I always say, <laughs> rather than living longer. We're going to have more. We're going to have just an ass load of people that can't remember what's going on because they're sick and they might still be living to be like a hundred, which is fucking crazy. Yeah. And there's even more and more research and more evidence coming out all the time about your cholesterol levels in accordance to cancer and having your cholesterol be low, uh, being starting to be identified more with, with, with cancer like effects, you know? And so not cancer like effects with getting cancer. I mean, that's, that's crazy, you know? So at some point, people are like, hey, you know what? You, I, I, I think there, we'll get to a point, but I don't know when, where doctors are going to have to just finally say, you need dietary cholesterol. Like, you should be eating eggs. You know, you're, hey, what's going on? Your cholesterol is really low. Your triglycerides are really high. That's actually very unsafe, not only for your heart, but also for you could potentially end up with cancer. You mm -hmm. need to figure out a way to reverse this. You should be eating meat and eggs. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know when that's going to happen. Yeah, that's, well, I mean, that is one of the, like, even if you're not keto, that's one of the benefits of eating more meat. You're going to actually get more dietary fat in your diet. And I think it's also going to be, you know, when people stop thinking that, I guess, fats are bad for you too, because that's another thing that is still kind of popular in an idea, even though keto has been getting popular the last few years, some people are still like, ooh, that's a lot of fat, or a lot of fat is bad. Yeah. Um even my mom, when I was younger, you know, when she'd make meats, uh, she would make sure to drain all the fat or get rid of all the fat on the meat, right? Because her doctor told her you shouldn't be eating, you right. shouldn't be feeding your kids high fat, right? So that's another thing, not just, you know, get, like, getting people to eat meat, but also letting people know that fats aren't, fats are actually very, very good for you, you know? So 
that's one of the things that I guess we're also having to deal with. But we can't forget, I mean, we have Dr. Saladino and Dr. Sean Baker, but Ken Berry, he, mm-hmm. he is also carnivore right now, but that's another individual who is a doctor who has talked about the oversights of individuals in that field. And we're not bashing doctors, by the way, right? We're, like, they're here to help us, you know, but... Ken and even himself went over the fact that like, yes, they're not taught a lot about nutrition in medical school, number one. Number two, they don't necessarily always have the time to stay on top of what might actually be working now, mm. right? They have to do or have to, they have to help you with things that they've learned and things that other practitioners are doing. Right. So you can't always depend on that individual to know everything that you need to be doing for your own health. You need to try shit out for yourself and see what happens. And then in terms of being an expert, you know, was Steve Jobs an expert? You know, like he, he didn't, he stopped going to school, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, just, I know it's just one example, but there's millions of examples where people, I mean, that is like the ex, that's like the text based expert, like one of the, you know, one of the most brilliant people to probably ever walk the face of the earth, you know, if you think about it in those terms. I think, I think, you know, to, back to kind of what Andrew was saying about the doctor's <clears throat> prescription. You know, let's just do this. Let's just like UFC it, you know, like in the UFC, they say, um, you know, what do they say? Like with fights, Andrew, in terms of like uh, the fights going to distance, what do they usually say? You you know this one? Mm -hmm. Uh, They say it it in boxing, too, but Uh, don't leave it in the hands of the um, judges, judges. Mm -hmm. Don't leave it in the hands of your doctor. You know, don't get yourself. Don't get yourself in a bad predicament. You know, like start eating better now. Start making better choices now. Um fuck the evidence and fuck this uh, research and all that <laughs> shit and start doing your own. Start, you know, investigating a little bit. Be like, oh yeah, they mentioned Dr. Barry. I'm going to check out his YouTube channel. All right, let me see. Hmm, low carb diet. Ah, all right, well, maybe I'm going to give it a shot. Let me try bacon and eggs and some steak for a few days and see what happens and get some blood work done here and there. And Right? I mean, why not? Why not poke around and see but what are you doing now? You know, what are you doing now about your health? What are you doing now about the condition that you're in? Are you do are you doing anything? And if you are doing stuff and you feel really healthy and you feel really good, then you don't have to really worry about, you know, only eating meat or or being on a meat based diet. If things seem to be going really well for you and you feel healthy, uh, we don't know everything. We just know what we know. We just know what's in front of us. And we're just trying to share that with you because it's worked well for us. And we're hoping that it'll work well for you. But if something else is already working well for you, then I, I think you should uh, continue onward. Just as long as you're not getting sick and not getting weaker and uh, not becoming more unhealthy, then I think we're good to go. Sounds good to me. Mm-hmm. All right. I think we should get the hell out of here. What do you think? I, whatever you guys want to do. I can't wait to try your chocolate. Hmm. Shouldn't he be saying that to you? <laughs> that, that, I was trying to figure out how it's, I can flip that around. It's peanut butter cups. Yeah, it, well, it's not dark chocolate, so I guess milk chocolate it can kind of swing my way, maybe? Swing. <laughs> swing. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Wait, what's that uh, name? Oh, Lord. You guys have been like real flirty with each other the last couple podcasts. I'm kind of I don't, I don't, don't, jealous. Don't, don't, read, jealous. don't read into it too much, yeah. man. It's not I mean, I don't want to come between you guys but <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's, did I say something did I say something wrong <laughs> oh, I said, oh I said between right okay I get it <laughs> oh, man. oh okay Andrew hasn't been that excited in about five years. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that I sound he made was priceless. Yeah. You need to make like a just a I don't know. You know what it is just something out of that sound that you can press, press a button and it plays. Yeah, soundboard. You know? Soundboard. You need, yeah. you need to soundboard that. Yeah. Where that can people fun. find you, Andrew? At I am Andrew Z on Instagram, but please make sure you're following the podcast on Instagram as well, at Mark Bell's Power Project, and then at MB Power Project on Twitter, TikTok, and Byte. And you guys have been absolutely crushing the reviews. We mm. sincerely appreciate that. If you get any value from anything we do, just a simple, quick, and easy way to thank us is to just go to iTunes and drop a review like our boy 74 Drew 74. He says, late to the game, but I'm here. Quote, I wish I'd found this podcast sooner, but I'm here to stay now. This is so much fun and great information. So if you guys have been following us for a long time, our boy Drew right here just found us at the start of, well, sorry, at the end of January. <clears throat> That's 
that's unacceptable. If you guys are a part of the Power Project Army, you need to be telling your friends about us. Um, but for Drew, thank you so much, man. We sincerely appreciate that. If you guys want to hear your name and your review read on air, go to iTunes right now, drop a review, and you could hear your name on air just like our boy Drew. And Seema, where are you at? Oh, God. Um, Uh-oh. If, if you, you, well, y'all are listening, but uh, go to YouTube and type in Lemon Drop. <laughs> I'm an unacceptable. Uh, you just got to do that. You'll get a good laugh out of that. That's exactly what I was thinking when Andrew said okay. that. So <laughs> Lemon Drop, unacceptable, YouTube it, and enjoy your day. I'm at Ensima Inyang on Instagram, YouTube, and Byte. At Ensima Yinyang on Twitter and TikTok. I'll mention this again, fighting against Chad Wesley Smith in Costa Mesa this weekend on February 8th. If you live in the area, which I don't because that's in SoCal, you guys can come watch the fight on Saturday. You can go to flowgrapplingticks.com. I'll have it. I'll, I'll put the link somewhere so you guys can come, but we need some uh, Power Project supporters out there. Okay, mm-hmm. so see you then. I am at Mark Smelly Bell on YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, <laughs> Instagram, and then also check out markbell.com if you want to check out some of my workouts, some of my nutrition. I'm sharing stuff kind of all over the place. Still going to be sharing stuff for free, so no one needs to get their panties in a bunch. <laughs> but uh, it's been awesome. A lot of people have signed up over there already, so let's keep that momentum going. Go check it out. See if it's for you. You get a week for free. And strength is... Oh. No, just real, oh, real. Oh, sorry, my bad. Uh, oh, oh. Huge thanks to Piedmontese. Oh, yeah. Totally Ooh. forgot about... <laughs> yeah. Uh, they sponsor the show, and our World Car- Carnivore Month, they were obviously a staple for all of us. Um, we are meat-based, so obviously we're going to be, you know, favoriting uh, some some better cuts of beef, and there's literally no beef on the planet that's better than what... Pe- we got a vacuum going? That's the first. Uh then Piedmontese beef, it's uh, head over to Piedmontese.com. That's P I E D M O N T E S E.com at checkout. Enter promo code Power Project for 25% off your order. This is interesting that there's a vacuum going on right now. <laughs> uh, and if your order is $99 or more, you get free two day shipping. Again, Piedmontese.com, promo code Power Project, 25% off. Thanks, Mark. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you all later. <laughs>